Happy Sabbath. I'm going for that 1800s look. It's not going to last much longer. My wife's about sick of it. She's shaking her head back there. Oh, um, but you know, the cold weather. I mean, I'm going to feel naked when I shave this thing off. My face is going to be cold. <laughs> but with a black hat, it works, let me tell you. Anyway, um, B's prayer was very powerful. Um, it touched my heart. But I, I wanted to be known that, um, you know, Jesus, I mean, we are not waiting on Jesus. Jesus is waiting on us. We have to understand that. It's, it's, it's us. We are the people that is going to vindicate God and, and bring Him. And He's going to come in a mighty way. He wants to. More than we're even willing to want him to come, he wants to come. Now, um, I've entitled this little talk, The Foolishness of God. That sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? The Foolishness of God. Or let me say, maybe the big picture, okay? Uh, we're right here in 1 Corinthians, so let's just jump right into it. I want to start in verse 25, if we would. There it is. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Did I say something wrong? First chapter. First chapter. Chapter 1. Chapter one. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Chapter 1, verse 25. Okay. I didn't mean to confuse everybody. I know where I want to be. <laughs> All right, let's try again. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Amen. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confine, confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised, has God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring things to not things that are. Amen. Can you stop and think about that in today's vernacular? I mean, look at the world today. It's craziness. Now, I don't care on what side of the aisle you fall, and I'm, I'm not here to talk politics in any way, but I want to bring up something that I haven't heard anybody talk about. I remember when the president, Trump, was running the first time. He said that these, um, uh, who are these guys that supposedly just got robbed by all this money because of all the trading that's going on? The, um, the ding, what do they call? Hedge fund. Hedge, hedge fund guys. I remember him talking about how the hedge fund guys are just, just robbing, robbing the blind, robbing the people, right? And he said it was disgusting. And he knows a lot of these people, right? I remember that. Well, now they're, they're talking about making fun of all these people, the Robin Hood people, right, that are the little guys that have come in and taken some back, right? And this all happens after he gets out of office. Nobody says anything. I don't know. I, I kind of caught that. Did anybody else think about any of that? The foolish things people call foolish. God may just use to slap you around. <laughs> Things that think they're mighty may not be so mighty. God is the perfect gentleman, right? He doesn't scream and holler. He doesn't carry on. He speaks softly. He has full authority and all power. 
You know, it's funny because when I was in my prayer this morning and, and just, you know, I can't even, I don't even know anymore what I'm thinking or just praying with God. I, you know, I'm confused anymore what it is and where it is. I, I, it's just, it kind of blended sometimes. This morning when I was thinking about the stumbling block the Bible talks about, you know, the Jews were building the temple and there was this stumbling block. It was right in the middle and they got to walk around it. It's always in their way. And they're building this temple and then they get the temple almost built and they realize they need this cornerstone. This cornerstone that they've been bumping into the whole time, right? That um, they thought was in the way. It was a mistake. What's it even doing here? How did it even get here? It's perfectly cut. Fits into the building to make it what it's supposed to be. It gives it all its strength. The cornerstone. Without the cornerstone, the building goes tough. You follow me? You have all these plans in the world, these evil plans, these desires to, to bring the world together as one, as God has said, is not going to happen. Correct? They forget to see that in every one of these rooms where evil is devised is this stumbling block. This rock that was hewed without hands. Does it start to make a, a picture in your mind? It comes flying through the air. And what does it talk about in Daniel? That this rock will do? It will crush right at the feet and destroy all of what their plans are trying to do to deceive men, take over the world. You know, it, it's funny because God gives the devil a long leash and it seems like he's the captain in control. But we have to remember that there's a stumbling block in every one of these rooms where evil is devised and he knows every part of their plan. God will not be beaten. He may seem like he loses some battles, but I, I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, he will win the war. Okay. He has promised us. You know, you, you, you can't fight somebody that knows everything. You just can't do it. There's no chance. You can't win. Um, Richard was talking this morning about Sabbath school when they were having this battle. Gideon. Gideon's carrying a lamp, right? In a clay pot. And he busts the clay pot and what, what does it do? Light. Light. And what happens? What happens to all the enemies? They, they killed themselves, didn't they? There was no battle. Gideon did nothing. God did it. Have you ever been struck with terror? Have you ever been really afraid? Have you been so afraid and you, you couldn't even stand up? Real fear. That's the way God's enemies are going to be with. There's going to be an end to this garbage. And God has promised us that this, this sin thing will never, ever raise its ugly head again. Praise the Lord. We have to trust Him. We have to listen to Him. I want to read you a little something. The name of this is, um, well... While today we marvel at the extraordinary accomplishments of our founding fathers, their own reaction to the U.S. Constitution when it was presented to them for their signatures was considerably less enthusiastic. Benjamin Franklin, ever the optimist at age 81, gave what was for him, a remarkable restrained assessment in his final speech before the Constitutional Convention. When you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joint wisdom, you inevitably 
assemble a number of men, I'll just read it over again, you inevitably assemble with those men all their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinion, their local interests, and their selfish views. He thought it impossible to expect a perfect production from such a gathering, but he believed that the Constitution that had just had just been ratified with all its faults was better than any alternative that was likely to emerge. Amen. Nearly all of the delegates harbored objections, but persuaded by Franklin's logic, they put aside their misgivings and affixed their signatures to it. Their overriding concern was the tendency in nearly all parts of their young country toward disorder and disintegration. Americans had used the doctrine of popular sovereignty, democracy, as the rationale for their successful rebellion against English authority in 1776. <laughs> But they had not yet worked out fully the question that had plagued all nations aspiring democratic government ever since, how to implement principles of popular majority rule while at the same time preserving stable government that protects the rights and liberties of all citizens. Few believe that the new federal constitution alone would be sufficient to create a unified nation out of a collection of independent republics spread out over a vast physical space, extraordinarily diverse in their economic interests, regional loyalties, and ethnic and religious attachments. And there would be new signs of disorder after 1787 that would remind Americans what an incomplete and unstable national structure they had created. Settlers in West Pen Western Pennsylvania rebelled in 1794 because of their local, locally distilled whiskey taxes on it. In Western North Carolina, there were abortive attempts to create an independent Republic of Franklin, which would ally it align itself with Spain to ensure its independence from the United States. There was continued conflict with Indians across the whole western frontier and increased fear of slave unrest, particularly when the news of the slave-led revolution in Haiti reached American shores. Now, I want to say this. I'm just going to jump down here. Should glory in his presence. 
But of him. The Bible says, but of him. What does that mean? God. By God's doing, right? But of him. Or by God, by God's doing. Okay? Are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption? Amen? Amen. All right. I want to read you a little something here. It is the duty and privilege of all to use a far, to use reason as far as man's finite faculties can go. But there is a boundary where man's resources must cease. There are many things that can never be reasoned out by the strongest intellect or discerned by the most penetrating mind. Philosophy cannot determine the ways and works of God. The human mind cannot measure infinity. Can you get your mind around infinity? I can't even get my mind around a billion dollars. I don't even know what that would look like. I try to think about infinity. What, what does that mean to you? I mean, how do you... How do you even try to wrap your mind around something that large? And God occupies all of this. Who else speaks in a way that he says, I've seen the end of all things come up before me? You know, there are these evil people that get together and try to rule the world and do their thing, but there is a Father God in heaven and His Son. <laughs> And the Holy Spirit. And they also convene and talk. And they have a plan. They have a perfect plan. And that plan will come to fruition. I just want to see it before I die. How long are we going to put up with this? You know, think about the rebellion in heaven, brothers and sisters. Think about the rebellion in heaven. If, if God just went out and reacted and, and just took the devil out, how would that have went down? That would have been a horrible, horrible mistake, right? There would have been sympathy for the devil, right? So what did he do? He let it fester, right? He let it come. He, you think he didn't know? Of course he knew. But what could he do? He had to allow it to play out, right? So what do you think happened? You think people like um, people like you came up and said, "God, we can't, we can't do this anymore. Look at this. Look at what's going on here. Look at this insurrection. Look at these people. You, you got to stop this, right? You think that's maybe how what happened? And Jesus, at that point, people have made decisions, right? At this point, people have been on a side. They're on God's side or they're on the enemy's side. And God throws the enemy out of heaven. And where does he end up? Here. Right? Okay. This battle, which was a political war, brothers and sisters, whether you like it or not, started in heaven. And now it's here. And what do you think is going to end it? The same thing is going to end it here that ended it there. When we got a bunch of people that are sold out, lock, stock, and barrel for Jesus Christ, and they said, we've had enough, Lord. I mean, they are praying day and night. They have given their whole hearts to God. The love is absolutely reciprocal. Do you follow me? They've learned how to die to self. Father, come. Right? It's game over. This is what's going to finish the work. It's up to us. It's us, brothers and sisters. When we get serious about sin and about not wanting to be here anymore, that's when we're going to go home. That's the ticket. I can't see it finishing any other way. God has promised there'll be a people. They will be vindicated, and God will be vindicated in this, in this people. Amen? Amen. Okay. All right. Let us, uh, let me finish here.
Jehovah is the fountain of all wisdom, of all truth, of all knowledge. There are high attainments that man can reach in this life through the wisdom that God imparts. But there is an infinity beyond that will be the study and the joy of the saints throughout eternal ages. Can I hear an amen? amen. Isn't that exciting to think about that? Growing in grace and knowledge and the glory of God to see Him. Your prayers will go away and they'll turn into what? You don't need to pray anymore because He's there, right? What will you do? Worship. Praise. Right? And see. Man can now only linger upon the borders of the vast expanse and let imagination take its flight. Finite man cannot fathom the deep things of God, for spiritual things are spiritually discerned. The human mind cannot comprehend the wisdom and power of God. We've got to be gentle with our brothers and sisters. Because if they don't know God, they can't even discern anything spiritually. They're walking around blind. So you've got no right to be mad at them. You should expect them to do the wrong thing. Amen. Without Jesus Christ, how in the world do you do the right thing? I have Jesus and I still fight with doing the right thing. You follow me? And I know. Look, before my feet hit the floor, I want to I want to eat something nasty. I want to do things that I shouldn't be doing. I gotta give it up. I gotta let the Lord lead. Let us turn back to 1 Corinthians. You guys are still there. I'm going to the left. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to begin at verse 9. You there? But as it, as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that what? Love him. Who? How much do you love him? Remember what he said to Peter? How many times did he ask Peter if you love me? What did it do to Peter? It tore him up, didn't it? Tore him up. But what did it make him do? It, it forced him to see himself, didn't it? And then he realized where his dependency lied. Yeah, he meant everything he said. He, he said the right things, but the dependency was in the wrong place. If we depend upon ourselves, brothers and sisters, we're going to fail. If like we, like Peter, that learned at that moment that he needs to depend solely and wholly on Jesus Christ, what kind of preacher and leader did Peter become? Wow. Think about this. The Bible's my Bible. I don't know if you guys are reading your Bible. My Bible says that people got in the streets so that Peter's shadow would be cast upon them. And as his shadow was cast upon them, they were what? Healed. 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 You think he might have had the Holy Spirit in there somewhere? Because it wasn't Peter doing it. Wow. These are the kind of people we're going to have walking on this earth. Did that mean Peter didn't ever make another mistake? No, because Paul took him to the woodshed. Right? But his, the ring and tone of his life when he stopped the dependency upon self and, and sought out God and decided that he loved Jesus with every ounce of his fiber. He was victorious. If you heard nothing else I hear today, or you hear today from me, that's what I want you to leave here with. I want you to think about your love for God. How strong is it? Where is it centered? What are you willing to give up? What if he asks you to take a step in a direction that you don't want to go? Are you willing to take that step? Because I, I, you know, I, I'm not saying I know everything about God, 
but I've learned enough to know that he asks us to do things that don't make sense. Let us continue in verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. By his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. You want to know God's will for your life? Do you? How do you seek God's will for your life? By pouring yourself out before Him. Right? Opening His Word. Opening your heart. His heart is wide open. Wide open. We, brothers and sisters, are the problem. Not God. Not God. We. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what? Foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. I hope and pray that we can have more peace with our brothers and sisters and know that they, they don't even have a chance if they don't know Jesus. Right? They're just riding a bicycle that's got no chain. You know? They can't go anywhere. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. He's promised you the mind of Christ. Think about the power of the mind of Christ. Think about being able to sleep in a boat in a hurricane. Master, wake up. Don't you know we perish? He's like, ye of little faith. I, I, I met with my father this morning, and I've already seen that I'm going to be on the other side of the island here because i got some people to preach to. It doesn't matter. We're going to get there. If this boat capsizes, we're going. <laughs> you follow me? Think about the kind of faith that, that he had because he knew everything that needed to be done. Because he met with his father. He had the plan. Yes. Everything he did was a divine appointment. And you read through your Bible, you find out Jesus says, I did none of these things. I don't even speak my own words. How is that possible? Because he spoke the words of his father via the Holy Spirit. He said greater things than these, which he's talking about himself, y'all will do. Right? When are we going to believe it? When are we going to believe it? You know, you could have the winning lottery ticket. This is a bad illustration for Adventists, but here it is. You could have the winning lottery ticket, $5 million in your pocket, right? You can walk around with that thing in your pocket forever. And it's the winning ticket. But if you don't believe that's the winning ticket. It's not going to do you any good. Right? We have to believe. The Bible is alive. It's called the living word of God. Amen. But it has to get in you yes. to come alive. Amen. Amen. I'm glad somebody's saying amen. Amen. All right, let me turn to uh, Jeremiah 15, 16. 
you know where it is, you can follow me. If you don't, I'm, so I'm going to just read one verse here and I'm moving on. Jeremiah 15, 16. The word, thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of